morning, everybody. It's me again. Uh, this morning, I will speak to you about cross-border enforcement, and I have decided to focus on two specific aspects of cross-border enforcement. Notably, first of all, I think um, I'll spend well, maybe 20, 25 minutes talking about private international law issues, and um, then I will explain to you what WIPO is doing in domain name disputes. Um, because we have a center, the Arbitration and Mediation Center, which offers its services in case of IP disputes. Oh, that looked different from when I was preparing it, but uh, just imagine that it was all covered in green. So this is a situation, admittedly it's copyright, um, somebody who is, um, for example, streaming something in one country, the um, person who is looking at the infringing copy is in another country, and the judge with the whistle is in another place. So the original situation would be everybody's in one place, we don't have any problem. Now there can be a situation where the infringer is in a different country. Or there might be situations where the infringer is in one country, the technical material to stream the illegal copies of the work are in another country, and the um, consumer is in a third, different country. So in that case, of course, there are all kinds of questions that one would ask, notably, which court should decide in which country. And then once a court has found that it has jurisdiction, the next question would be which law applies. And then once the court actually has come to a judgment, is the judgment, can the judgment be enforced in another country? So these are issues that have gained in importance quite a lot over the last couple of years for exactly the reasons that Erling already already talked about, because the internet infringements that we know today, they happen uh, all around the world. The internet doesn't know any borders, but um, IP rights do. IP rights are territorial, so there are frictions. Now, um, I'll start with this case. There is Mr. Pinckney. Mr. Pinckney lives in France, and Mr. Pinckney created 12 songs. And um, if you look at the cover of the 12 songs that he created, and if you look at the facial hair and the uh, main hair of the actors, you can tell that was some time ago in the 70s. But that's not a problem, as you know, because copyright subsists um, for the life of the author plus 70 years. So he had, in the 70s, when he created these songs, he had released them on a, on a yeah, well, the old school, I don't know whether you remember them, these little discs, black and... Yeah, so a vinyl, a vinyl version of his songs. One day he was looking at the internet and he noticed that his songs were offered for sale, were offered for sale on a CD. And he thought, well, that can't be quite right because I never authorized the production of my songs on a CD. And I never authorized the CDs that I had never authorized to be sold. So how come that now on the internet people sell my city. Now it turns out the company who had uh, un, in an unauthorized manner produced the CDs is a company in Austria. And the company who markets the CDs through the website is in the UK. So obviously the question is not so easy. Where would Mr. Pinckney go and, uh, and sue? Does anybody want to take a guess? Well, I guess I would do the same that Mr. Pinckney did. If I live in France and I think my rights are infringed, I would first go to my court in France, right? And that's what he did. And um, the uh, first instance court thought that was absolutely fine. That was challenged. Um, the uh, second instance court um, gave right to the company M, to the producer, saying that France should not be should not have jurisdiction. And then so the whole case came uh, before the Court of Justice of the European Union. 
Now, all kinds of questions. Is there copyright? What is protected? Damages, infringement? And what are the criteria that we should apply to solve all these questions? When we talk about jurisdiction um, in Europe, it's fairly simple because there is actually, um, we actually have um, law that applies, namely the Brussels I regulation, which um, place, um, places a lot of importance on the fact that the rules of jurisdiction should be highly predictable and generally be based on the defendant's domicile. But it also re recognizes that um, sometimes it's necessary to be able to sue in a different country because of the close connection between the court and the action. And if we look at the specific rules, Article 2.1 says that persons domiciled in a member state shall, whatever their nationality, be sued in the courts of that member state. So this is the general principle, which in that case would have meant Austria. But then Article 5.3 is a special rule saying that a person domiciled in a member state may in another member state be sued, and then a couple of things come, but the thing that is important for us, in matters related to tort, delict, or quasi-delict, in the courts for the place where the harmful event occurred or may occur. So this is the criteria that we need to look at. With which is the place where the harmful event occurred or may occur? And just um, to, to complete the picture, we'll also look at Article 22. So whenever an IP dispute relates to questions of registration or validity, then of course it's the court of the member state in which the registration or the validity is in question. But this is not what, what, what is interesting for our case. Our case is really dealing with infringement. So Article 5.3. Now, the European Court looked at the criterion established by the Brussels I regulation, and it decided that the place where the harmful event occurred, or may occur, can actually mean two things. It can be the place of the event giving rise to the damage, or it can be the place where the damage occurred or may occur. And these places do not necessarily have to be the same, especially if we talk about online infringements. And if they are not the same, then the defendant may be sued at the option of the applicant in either of these two places. Now, how does that relate to Mr. Pinckney and his CD? Clearly, the events that gave rise to the damage did not occur in France, because the reproduction of the author's work in a material support, which is then sold via the internet. That didn't happen in France. It's just the internet which is accessible in France and from which uh, the city can be bought. But then the court said, looking at whether damage occurred or may occur, it said that it was likely that damage might occur in France because there is the possibility to obtain the CD from the internet and to have it delivered to France. So French courts were competent. However, there were two caveats that uh, the uh, court established. For there to be likelihood of the damage occurring in France, there must be, uh, the right must be protected in France. And of course, the French courts, once they find they have jurisdiction, they are only competent to determine damages caused in France. So that's a uh, consequence of the principle of territoriality. And very much in line with the rationale of the Brussels I Convention, because the, um, the idea there is that really the court should, be, should decide the case which is best placed to make um, a determination whether there is liability. There's a second case, uh, one year later, where we have a photographer, Miss Heiduk, who is Austrian, and she, makes, she takes pictures of, um, of an architectural building to be used um, as part of a conference, and the um, organizer of the conference, domiciled in Germany, they uh, put these pictures 
on the website for viewing and for downloading, something that the photographer had never allowed. So, of course, the photographer sued the uh, uh, Energieagentur NRW at the commercial court in Vienna because that was where she was living. And that court referred the question to the Court of Justice of the European Union, again for a preliminary ruling. And the court said the causal event did not occur in Austria because uh, what, ha what, what was necessary for the infringement to happen? That was that, um, what the court said, and slightly, um, well, how should I put it, um, in, in terms perhaps which um, show that uh, the technical functions are not entirely uh, understood, but they said, well, there's some technical processes that are set in place, and all this happened in, in uh, Germany. And Germany does not, uh, and uh, the uh, person, uh, the uh, entity who did that, the Energieagentur, their seat is in Germany and not in Austria. However, again, there was a likelihood of the damage occurring in Austria. And they said, for this likelihood to be there, it's not necessary that the internet address has a top-level domain AT for Austria. But simply the fact that the website is accessible from Austria is enough to say that there's a likelihood of damage. Which is quite broad. I mean, that gives the courts quite a broad uh, jurisdiction. Interesting about this case is the opinion of the Advocate General, which um, the court didn't follow. But it's interesting because he had a completely different vision. He said that in the event of delocalized damages over the internet, the best option is to exclude the possibility to sue before the courts of the member state where the damage occurred and instead to reserve the competence to the judges of the member state in which the causal event occurred. So just to show you that these questions are really debated even <laughs> amongst uh, the professionals. I mean, for the European Union at the moment it seems fairly settled, although as I said, um, it gives quite a broad um, vision of jurisdiction, so it remains to be seen whether that course is to be followed in the next couple of years. If we look at the applicable law, so once the court knows that uh, it has jurisdiction, it's fairly simple for, um, for IP rights, I would say. If we look at the Berne Convention, Article 5.2 states that the extent of protection as well as the means of redress afforded to the author to protect his rights shall be governed exclusively by the laws of the country where protection is claimed. And likewise, we have a similar stipulation in the Rome II regulation applicable in the European Union. The law applicable to a non-contractual obligation arising from an infringement of an IP right shall be the law of the country for which protection is claimed. Now, I said in the European Union it's fairly simple because we have these principles that apply all over the European Union. But there is nothing on the international level which would be comparable. So all these um, rules on jurisdiction, on applicable law, and on um, recognition of judgments, they differ from country to country. And we have seen quite a number of initiatives that try to harmonize it at the international level. The Hague Conference on Private International Law, um, this is a, another international organization based in The Hague who specifically deals with private international law issues. They had prepared a um, a treaty, an international treaty on the recognition of judgments about 10, 15 years ago, which never materialized in the end. And the reason why it didn't materialize was IP, because people couldn't agree on how to treat IP in this treaty. So there have been certain soft law initiatives. Uh, one of them is actually a WIPO joint recommendation, which um, in 2001, so I think... Uh, if I remember correctly, a year or two before the case um, in the UK actually was decided, the uh, uh, Irish case, what was the name again? 
Yeah, exactly, brick and mortar. Um, looking at looking at when use on the internet should be used in a specific country. This is what the joint recommendation um, addresses. But it's a recommendation, of course, so it's not legally binding. But it has seen some, some successes, also in the sense that it has been taken up by courts to decide jurisdiction, which was not clearly intended. But that's the way that um, it was um, received. And then in several parts of the world, there were initiatives mostly, um, mostly run by academics trying to establish principles that could apply on all these questions of jurisdiction, applicable law, and the recognition of judgments. And basically, these, um, these initiatives, they prepared um, their principles in a way that pretty much looks like a treaty. I mean, if you, if you read it, it has articles, and it could be adopted as an international instrument if countries decided to do so. And the last initiative, the, private, uh, the International Law Association, the Committee of IP and Private International Law, this is the first initiative on a global level, trying to take um, from all these regional initiatives um, some elements to come up with a approach that could be applicable worldwide. And they are um, still planning to release their guidelines in 2016, so later this year. So um, we at WIPO, we think well, actually, Beck, our interest in the topic was spurred by the fact that whenever we do capacity building activities um, with judges or with prosecutors, and we talk about infringements on the internet, there's always going to be one question um, asking us, how do we deal with cases where there are cross-border elements, where there is a foreign element? And so it is a topic that's very much of interest to our our audience, so to speak. So we decided to, um, to do a bit more work on it. So we organized a seminar on these issues where we invited the um, representatives of the different regional initiatives and also of the new global initiative. That was last year. And we organized a study. We sent a questionnaire to national experts in 19 countries asking them whether they could give us examples of cross-border, uh, sorry, of uh, IP disputes with cross-border elements, online IP disputes with cross-border elements. And Professor Andrew Christie from uh, Australia, he then took it upon him to um, synthesize the results. And he wanted to, looking at the results, he wanted to really come up with an idea of what are the most um, pressing issues. So what is the typical case of an online IP infringement with cross-border elements? So he looked at the facts, he looked at the claim, he looked at what the um, judge finally ordered, and he looked at the question, were actually issues of private international law raised by the parties or by the court? And we can see in the first table here that trademark clearly is the, um, the area which gives rise to most uh, online IP disputes with cross-border elements, then followed by copyright. And if we look at what type of um, disputes are most common, then it's about online marketing and online distribution, followed by domain main registration. So I think it's, it's quite nicely fits with uh, what Erling said earlier, because all the different uh, business models that he has explained give rise potentially also to disputes. And the cross-border elements that were present in these cases was mostly because of the action. So the act giving rise to infringement occurred outside the local jurisdiction. For example, as we had seen in the Pickney case, or the party location, at least one of the parties was domiciled outside the local jurisdiction. Ninety-five percent of all cases concerned civil claims and only five percent were criminal. 
And if we look at table two, that um, tells us whether the claim was for primary infringement or for secondary infringement, and the large majority, 84%, concerned primary infringement. And it was really infringement cases. So validity of the IP right was not really an issue, at least in 94% of the cases. And quite interesting from the point of view of private international law, in 88% of all cases, there were no parallel proceedings. So what does this mean? Um, the, the basis upon which the different initiatives to harmonize private international law aspects on a worldwide basis um, have been conducted was that there is a need because if we don't have these principles, the, um, uh, the, uh, the party whose right is infringed would have to go and sue the infringer in different countries to get all the damages that uh, he is entitled to. So that would be parallel proceedings. So one of the things that Professor Christie wanted to look at is, is there actually an empirical basis for that? And apparently, at least, there are no parallel proceedings in 88% of the cases. So what does this mean? He had some uh, concluding observations. He said, it's true, the internet is ubiquitous, which means that we could have two um, possible scenarios. We could have multiple actions in multiple countries, or we would have one action in one single country, but seeking relief for various territories. But against that background, what he found was that there were no multiple actions in multiple countries and no single action seeking multi-country relief. So he asked, um, perhaps actually it then is not such a pressing issue in practice. It could be one explanation or the other explanation could be that the parties are actually not aware of um, all the things that they could do. So one recommendation that Professor Christie made was that um, WIPO should work at providing more accessible information on these private international law issues. And this is um, what we um, plan to do. We have a common project running together with the Hague Conference on private international law to establish some, well, it's going to be a bit of a guidebook for judges with um, the most common scenarios that can happen um, displaying a foreign element where private international law issues become relevant and explaining what other countries uh, are doing in these, in these situations. Now, just to finish uh, this part off, the Hague Conference is also working again on the uh, judgment project, the recognition and enforcement of judgment. And this time, things look quite uh, favorable. Um, the adoption process will begin, has begun actually, and um, IP is probably going to be um, regulated in that treaty, um, but still, as I said, the, um, the deliberations are still happening, and there's quite a number of um, very technical questions where the experts are not um, in agreement right now. Okay, I think I will skip through these draft articles and turn to what WIPO is doing in domain name disputes, unless there is a question regarding private international law issues. Sorry. No, <laughs> please. Uh, maybe a, a sort of forum shopping by uh, using the private international law where the damages will be uh, the, m uh, the most favorite one? Did well, you find out some, uh, some information about that? Well, it's a different, um, 
it's a different question, right? This is rather a question of the substantive law. Yeah, that's and right. If we, yeah. Talk, if, if, we, if we keep in mind that IP rights are territorial, yeah. uh, even if you go to a country which knows, for example, punitive damages, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. guess they would only award these punitive damages in view of the harmful events that occurred in their country. Mm -hmm. So a bit like the, um, the caveat that the European Court of Justice made. When I studied, we had the cases that uh, three uh, territories would be involved and the damaged person can uh, select the country um, where the damages would be the, the highest. So mm. uh, some cases may be the, um, a company in France will uh, deliver uh, dirty water to the Rhine River and uh, it damaged the tomato plantations in, in the Netherlands. So the damaged uh, company, uh, the company of uh, Netherlands, would look where the damages would be the, uh, the oh. highest one. Yeah. Thank you. So at least from the empirical overview that uh, Professor Christie did, um, it seems that this is not really happening in the relation to IP. But I know that uh, I know that the the danger exists, of course. Yes. Anybody else? Any questions? No. Okay. So let's talk to let's talk about uh, domain names. And I'm quite happy that Erling already provided an introduction, so I can skip all the technical aspects. Now, domain names are quite an important uh, business as business asset these days. So, for example, sex.com is worth 14 million uh, U.S. dollars, or beer 7 million U.S. dollars. And, of course, there is a, uh, an incentive for um, infringers to abuse domain names, namely by registering the trademark of somebody else. And this is what um, is typically called cyber squatting. And this is exactly the type of problem that um, WIPO addresses. Now, we've already heard uh, quite a bit about the domain name system. We have uh, 315 million registered domain names, and uh, there are generic top-level domains and there are country code top-level domains. So top-level domains is everything after the last dot, as we saw. So for example, .lv would be the country code top-level domain for Latvia. And each top-level domain is managed by a registry, and out of this registry all over the world, there are more than 1,000. And the whole system is held together, as we have already heard, by the Internet Corporation of Assigned Names and Numbers. And it's ICANN, who then has contractual arrangements with these registries, and the registries will have a contract with anybody who wants to register a domain name. And it's very important to keep this whole contractual uh, background in mind because this is what will allow um, WIPO to, um, to come to solutions in these cases of cyber squatting. And the tool to do so is the UDRP, the Uniform Domain Name Dispute Resolution Policy, which has been in place since 1999. So it's applicable to all uh, GTLDs, but also many of the country code top level domain names. But it's only uh, for a specific type of infringement, namely cyber squatting. So for clear cut cases of trademark abuse. So, um, and we'll look at the criteria just in the next slide. And it's contractually mandated, as I said. So um, it makes it very easy to enforce it because once um, it has been decided that there was a trademark abuse, then uh, the um, registry will either transfer the domain name um, to the legitimate right holder or will cancel the domain name. And it will do so without any court order because it, this is what their contract with the registering party foresees. In case of infringement, uh, that's what the registry can do. So it's a very simple and very effective solution because after a couple of weeks, uh, the cyber squatter, the person who abuses the trademark of somebody else by registering as, as a domain name, he will be without the domain. 
And it doesn't mean that um, the traditional court system would not have any role to play, because if any of the two parties isn't happy with the decision, they can, of course, go to court. Now, as I said, it's very effective. It's an online process between 60 and 75 days. It's quite cheap. Um, it depends a bit on how many people will look at the case because the person who decides these cases are um, experts, neutral experts, and um, if one person only looks at the case, then um, the fee would be 1,500 US dollars for one to five domain names. And if a panel of three experts looks at these cases, then it would be 4,000 US dollars. So compared with the um, costs that you would have if you went to court, um, it's very, very cheap. And it's very predictable because uh, WIPO has been doing that for 16 years and there have been over 34,000 cases so far concerning 63,000 domain names. Now, what, is, what are the criteria that need to be shown to come to this uh, result? Namely, the complainant, he must uh, show that um, a trademark is used as a domain which is identical or confusingly similar, so that you will recognize. He must show that the registrant does not have any rights or legitimate interests in using the, the trademark, his trademark as a domain name. And he must show that the domain name was registered and used in bad faith. Now, the UDIP decisions, they are not per se binding, but it's still uh, true that some trends are um, run through various decisions and um, repeat themselves. There's a database that you can look at um, to find all cases that were decided under the UDIP and some more sources of information. Now, how does it work? The first step is that the complainant uh, files a complaint, which um, will be reviewed um, for compliance, and then the actual procedure starts. The um, registrant is asked to send a response to the complaint, which in some cases don't come, in some cases they do. And then a panel is appointed. As I said, either one or three members. Typically, it would be one member. But if any of the parties want the panel to be three members, then um, it will be three members. So the panel will look at the case and decide. And immediately uh, after that, the registrar will implement. Well, immediately not, because the registrar waits 10 days whether, uh, to see whether either of the party goes to court. Because um, obviously in that case it doesn't want to um, cancel the domain name should then a court decide afterwards that uh, the domain name was actually legitimate, uh, then it would uh, not be the right decision. Now we have about 10 cases every day that come new um, and uh, the, the variety of domain names that can be an issue in one case is quite broad, so it can be between one to 1,500 domain names per case. Typically, it's less than five domain names. Uh, parties from 177 countries and in 21 case languages. Steadily going up, the number of case filings per year and for the last couple of years, They've always been between 2,500 and 3,000 cases. If we look at the type of domain names concerned, we will see that um, the large majority, 72%, 72.5% of the cases, they relate to the traditional generic top-level domains, like, as we said earlier, .com, .int, uh, .org. 13.1% relate to the new generic top-level domains. That's um, when we talk about new generic top-level domains. We talk about um, a process that has begun, I think, two years ago, where ICANN started to sell top-level domains 
based on basically the demand side. So anybody could bid for a um, top level domain. So nowadays we have um, top level domains which are for example .beer that you could buy. So these are these new uh, generic top level domains. 14% of the cases related to country code top level domains. And there was an increase, there's an uh, increase in the caseload of about 5%. Now, if we look at some of the, some of the trends in the decisions that come up, um, it's quite interesting to see that, of course, counterfeiting remains a problematic issue. Um, so, for example, in the case on the right, the complainant also claims that the respondent is manufacturing counterfeit products and marketing them under the trademark with the aim at disturbing the business of the complainant. So in this, case, in this instance, the domain name cybersquatting is just a model to promote the actual illegal counterfeiting uh, selling business. Or in the case on the bottom, the panel finds on the undisputed evidence that by using the domain name for his website, the respondent has intentionally attempted to attract internet users to this website for commercial gain by creating a likelihood of confusion with the complainants Isabel Marandmark. But there's also some further going trends. So for example, the fraudulent use of the domain name to pose as complainants clients or corporate partners, um, a bit like the case that we've heard earlier, um, uh, association uh, where, where the um, domain name registrant tries to associate himself with another company, although no link exists in reality. So for example, on the case to the right, there is no web page associated with the disputed domain name, sapinks.com. Indeed, the respondent used the complainant's name to register the disputed domain name and is using the disputed domain name to generate fraudulent purchase orders and used it to order uh, 20,000 US dollar worth of equipment on the complainant's account. So in this instance, a domain name is registered, but if you type it into um, your browser, it would not lead to any page. So there is, there is no, no page visible to anybody, but you can still use uh, the domain name, for example, in your email address. So you could still create the impression that you have an association with another company by registering a domain name, although you won't have a web page on that domain name. So that was this particular case. And also, another trend that we see is fraudulent use of the domain name for phishing schemes. So in the case on the bottom, the respondent's phishing scheme to email job-seeking individuals fraudulent job offers purporting to come from the complainant. If we look at the new generic top-level domains, we also see that for the moment, most cases are dealing with um, instances in which the trademark exactly matches the domain name or is highly descriptive. So Bloomberg.news, MichelinStyle.guide are some examples. Now, the um, domain name resolution is one part of the work that my colleagues in the um, WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center are doing. But the other um, important uh, part of their work is related to um, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. So for example, mediation, arbitration, and expert determination. Uh, in order to do that, WIPO has a network of uh, neutral, well, what they call neutrals, 1,500 arbitrators mediators and experts with uh, specialized knowledge in IP from more than 100 countries. And there's two offices, the one at WIPO headquarters and one in Singapore. And um, what is interesting, again, is the fee structure because WIPO is offering these services not for profit and the time cost efficiency in solving IP disputes. So we see that many, um, many parties actually prefer to at least try to come um, to a solution through ways of alternative dispute resolution before they go to court, because it is cheaper and because it is quicker. 
Now, what usually happens is that um, an initial contract will already foresee that should at any point in the future a dispute arise, that dispute will first be submitted to WIPO or another um, alternative dispute resolution service provider. And then, depending on what is stipulated in the contract, it either goes for mediation, arbitration, expert determination. So mediation, just to perhaps quickly um, clarify the terminology. In mediation, um, the parties would come together and they would, um, they would uh, discuss the dispute and they would have the help of a neutral intermediary who would, find, who would help them find a solution. And the outcome of a mediation would be a settlement contract, so an agreement by the parties themselves. Arbitration, on the other hand, in arbitration, the outcome is a binding award, a binding, um, a binding decision, so to speak, made by the arbitrator. So the parties agree on a person who should, um, who should decide the dispute, and then this person, the arbitrator, um, will um, come to, to a decision. Expedited arbitration, which is a particular form of arbitration offered at WIPO, which is a bit quicker than the usual arbitration, and expert determination is more flexible. Expert determination um, can be used, for example, if the parties just, to want, uh, just want an expert opinion on one specific aspect before they decide whether, it's used, whether they need to go to court or whether they need to pursue alternative dispute resolutions to solve the problem that they have then they would go for this um, option. So basically you have, again, a neutral intermediary who would just provide his view of the case. So this is just an overview of um, what it is that most cases deal with, those cases that uh, come to WIPO for arbitration, mediation, or expert determination. The vast majority concerns patents, 35%, trademark 16, copyright 8, and then the questions of commercial nature, distribution energy, franchising, marketing, sports 19, and things related to um, information and communication technology, 22%, so also quite common. And the settlement rate is quite high uh, for mediation. 70, in 70% 70 of all cases, the parties come to a, uh, an agreement. And in uh, arbitration, it's still 37%. And only um, in the remaining 63%, the arbitrator will actually issue an award because no uh, mutually agreed settlement contract could be reached. Now, this is an example of what um, the model, what the clause could look like in, in a contract um, that the parties could agree on, um, where they would say that any dispute shall be submitted to mediation in accordance with the WIPO mediation rules, where and uh, in which language. And then you can specify some more um, aspects of what you would, um, this procedure to solve your problem look like. Plenty of sources uh, of information if uh, you're interested in finding out more. And that was actually everything I had prepared. I realize I'm uh, quite early. <laughs> That's good. We have, uh, well, depending on how many questions you will have, but. <laughs> Are there any questions? Okay, thank you.